Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, March 18th, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's equity meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Armstrong, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott? Present. Dr. Hager? Present. Ms. Pasture? Present. Ms. Mack? Present. Thank you. Ms. Armstrong, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Logan Washington? Present. Dr. McComas? Well, she's present, okay. Are there any other staff members on the call? Heather Lagerman? Megan Shea. Thank you. Wait, are there Debbie, oh, sorry. Sorry, Debbie Somerville. Thank you. OK, are there any board members present joining us? OK. Great. All right, so now we will go to our first item um, on the agenda. It's new business and it's the discussion of COVID-19 um, specific specified training for all staff. And I don't see for that who, would that be you, Dr. Logan Washington? No, actually I'm going to introduce um, Ms. Shea and um, Ms. Somerville to discuss the um, agenda item. I can reshare my screen so we can go to the slides that um, Ms. Somerville has to share. Okay, great, thank you. Good afternoon. This is Debbie Somerville with the Office of Health Services. So our approach, oh, I saw it for a second, Candid. Our approach to, um, to COVID training was uh, for school staff was to make it as real time as possible and as school specific as possible while, while providing for standardization. So it was kind of it was kind of trying to balance a lot of things. And um, so as we've all experienced this year, the science about COVID has continuously evolved. We've learned more about the pandemic. And so we didn't want to do um, provide training um, prior to long before we, we, we reopened because the information might have shifted. Um, so that was one thinking. The other was we wanted to make sure that the information was fresh in people's mind. There's a lot of, um, and pardon, pardon me, but it, a lot of noise um, in the public about what is true and not true about COVID. And we didn't want to have to compete um, over time with people mi hearing misinformation. Um, and so, so what we planned and what we delivered was that prior to reopening, mostly it was delivered in February, the school nurses provide, provided a standardized PowerPoint training to their teachers and school staff. So pretty much all classroom based staff um, on COVID um, practices and mitigation practices in their school. Do we, I don't know, if, how are we coming on that slide? So um, 
health services provided the um, the standardized slide deck and we actually went through that slide deck with our school nurses in early February um, to kind of make sure that they were comfortable with the content, had the research articles to back it up so they could answer any questions. And then the nurses scheduled this training with their principal. The week before we met with the nurses and kind of overviewed the training, we actually provided uh, professional learning to the school reopening teams um, as part of principal leadership development. So our principals knew this was coming and um, the schools developed teams that were coming up with the school, the school specific mitigation plan for. And so um, so this training was kind of building on what the school, how the school was applying mitigation in their setting. So if you can go to the next slide, Miss Washington. First, we um, we made sure that everybody kind of had common understanding about uh, the facts about COVID because mitigation for any disease is targeted to that disease. So we you can see here we kind of talked about transmission. The next slide. Uh, we then talked to them about daily home screening that is required for all of our students as well as our staff as a reminder, first of all, for staff. Um, that we didn't want them to come to school if they were sick, if they had been tested, if they had been quarantined, or if they actually had COVID, as well as um, what we expected for our students, because our students, when they come back the first day, provide us with a form from their parents acknowledging that they will be doing the daily screening. Um, and so the teachers will be receiving that, <clears throat> and each school has a process for turning those screening forms in. Next slide, please. This is the daily screening for the symptom check um, that staff and students make. Next slide. Um, and if I'm going too fast, please um, jump in if the if the committee has questions. I'm happy to pause. The next thing we really wanted to make sure of is that all school staff understood what PPE was indicated for different settings and and understood how to use it. So if you go to the next few slides, and Candace, you can kind of, um, oh, well, actually, I'll talk about this for a second. We did talk about, of course, that everybody's daily PPE is that face covering. And we talked about that the exception for Baltimore County is that we will not, a, a face covering that has a valve, which allows your um, exhaled air to go through, is not acceptable. So it has to be covered with a second because it's not protective of others. Um, we kind of have the nurses talk through the expectations for face coverings. Um, we had the nurses kind of give the rationale for double masking, which is it improves fit for sure. And we kind of had the nurses would explain that a second mask can help the first mask uh, adhere closer to the face, which provides better protection. Um, and for certain masks, a second mask can provide better filtration. Um, so depending if you have a single ply mask or if you have certain types of fabric, a second mask can provide better filtration. So the nurses talk that through with staff. Um, it's funny, every month in COVID, it's a new thing that's popular. In February, we were all talking about double masks and I guess March is the month of three or six feet. But anyhow, so, so February is the month of double masking. Um, and then we have a supply in every school of, um, of face masks for students and staff who forget or whose mask is is um, soiled and you can see all of our additions for schools were in there. So insert your school plan there. So the next slide. Um, and now we get into those extra PPE. Um, this is a plan that we developed um, after doing research about what other school systems were providing for PPE and then in discussion with our Baltimore County Department of Health. So it's actually a health department school system PPE grid. And so we kind of describe what PPE might you use when you're in these settings. So the first is the PPE when they're in small group instruction with students that are not following face, uh, wearing face coverings and they're in close proximity. So you can see that we recommend that face um, that face protection, the eye, the face shield or goggles and their face, their mask. The next um, slide, you can see that then we talk, oh, we talked about personal care on that previous slide. Um, we talk also about assessments. We're popping, aren't we? So personal care is often a, an area that um, more of our additional adults and paraeducators, but sometimes our teachers are involved with these kinds of activities of daily living and what um, 
what PPE they might be wearing. Um, obviously, if a child is not masked, a face shield is generally recommended and the nurses talked that through. So sometimes students who require assistance in the bathroom can tolerate a face covering and other times they can't. Same with feedings. You know, most of our students don't need to have um, eye protection or gowns on, but if the child is a child who's just discovered how to blow a raspberry, it might be a, a time where the staff would worry about a splash of, um, of body fluids. So the, the staff is taught that and much better than I'm teaching you. I'm kind of high level giving you the information that they were taught. The next slide. Um, we also talked about when you're doing kind of that close assessment with students and what staff would wear during the, those close prolonged assessments. Next slide. This talks a bit about our related services providers and what they would be using when a student is not wearing a face covering. And I think the next slide is the last. Um, what we do with speech therapy and you can imagine obviously with speech we we want our speech therapist wearing a face shield if the students not wearing face coverings because learning learning to make certain sounds is certainly challenging to not have any kind of um, splash or splatter. So then if you go to the next slide, so we kind of talked them through, answered questions about the core PPE. And one of our big questions that we get from staff is, well, what about a crisis situation? You know, although in most of our schools they're rare, but where we might have to physically restrain or hold a student, what should be worn then? And the model there is um, that what, what we hope to do is make sure that it's kind of a team effort. We want our staff protected, and we also understand that sometimes staff has to step in immediately to protect a student's safety or health. And in those cases, you can see that um, first bullet says only the staff necessary plus that one additional person to help with PPE. So I might have to step in without my face shield or goggles, but then someone's going to come to respond and provide me with my extra PPE or switch out um, as appropriate. So this was the guidance that the schools received and kind of we talked it through with them about how you can keep yourself safer. Um, even in a behavioral crisis. Next slide. And now what we did is we provided a series of short YouTube videos, which I'm not going to torture you with, but if you ever want to see them, we're happy to provide them. They're mostly homegrown videos. Um, some we were able to get off the internet about how to appropriately use PPE. So we kind of taught them the concepts of when to use, when to wear the PPE, and then we reinforced it with, and this is how. So here there was a video about face cloth face coverings, a video about using a face shield and how to clean your face shield because, and that's true with all of this, just using it a prop properly is not the only thing. Washing it is also important. The next one, please. Gloves, when, when to use gloves and how to use gloves appropriately. Um, we, we all see people that are wearing them constantly and there tend to be people who wa aren't washing their hands, which is so unhelpful for them as well as other, others. So we go through gloves. Next slide, please. And then we go through the whole deal. So in case a person never had to wear a gown, a face shield and their gloves, how would you appropriately put those on and take those off so that you didn't introduce um, germs to yourself? And that, you know, this is stuff that for nurses, it comes as second nature, um, but for people who haven't kind of been trained and um, accultured in the health field, it, it doesn't come as second nature. Next slide. So that was kind of the end of our PPE discussion. Um, we learned from our nurses that this presentation generally took about an hour because it, it was set up to be conversational. Then we talked them through about what to expect with cleaning. Um, we know that our teachers are worried about um, their buildings being cleaned appropriately, so we made sure they understood what's happening. Sometimes when we don't see things, we assume they're not done, and that certainly is just not true, so we wanted to be them to be sure what happens uh, behind the scenes. So um, as you all know, our classrooms are cleaned each evening and our desks are wiped down each evening so that those are cleaned and disinfected. In the midday as part of our reopening plan, you know that our high touch surfaces 
are cleaned in the middle of the day in accordance with the CDC guidance. And then the CDC says, yeah, you really can't clean when students are present. So that we wanted the teachers to understand that we will not be pushing building services into a classroom and spraying chemicals around when students are present with the exception of the spills concept. So we do do a cleanup um, of a student's desk who is being sent home with COVID like illness. And we obviously have always done cleanups when a student is um, vomits or is sick in the classroom. So we talk them through that. Next slide. Um, we got into a little bit more detail about how do you do the desk cleaning? Um, so in an elementary school, it's often pretty straightforward because the students may be in their classroom all or most of the day. And so there's no sharing of, of desks. But when two students are using a desk, we have to have a plan to clean between the students. And you know that works if they don't switch desks except overnight. But if it happens during the day, um, we, we worked with the um, nurses and the school teams on ideas. So if there's, um, if we can switch off desks and use them between alternating groups of students, that's one way so that all the desks eventually are used, but none are used twice within a day. Um, another way to, to um, keep desks and surfaces clean is to have those surfaces wiped down. Our older students can wipe them with our um, cleansing wipes. And obviously, if the teachers choose, they can use the multi-use uh, cleaner that Building Services provides them. Um, and each school and comes up with a different plan. And we found that um, it's worked pretty well. Um, in elementary schools, what we've been doing is focusing on um, you know, school-based problem solving. It's usually our special area teachers that have the biggest issues right now with the desk cleaning. And to my knowledge, they have all solved that you know, shared table, shared space cleaning really well. So I think that worked well. Next slide, please. Then we talked a bit about what do you do about shared items? We've struggled with this um, with our special area teachers as well as just with our principals. And so we try to teach the teachers our concepts. Um, that the first concept is you don't want to use shared items as much as you can minimize the use of shared manipulatives. If you introduce a manipulative that's shared between your class, the teacher has to come up with a plan for how to how to clean that. Uh, because our building services is not is not in our classroom aware of what teachers are using, nor um, you know do they have endless staffing if a teacher should choose to introduce a large number of shared items. Um, and then unfortunately, as a system, because we don't know all the manipulatives that a teacher might use to enhance instruction, we have to say, you know, if you introduce a manip manipulative, please be sure you research uh, the products that would be appropriate for that surface. And I know in things, um, Ms. Shea can talk about, you know, things that are centrally, are part of our curriculum, that the central office, the uh, curricular offices have provided guidance on, oh, here's the products and have, off and often, if not always, procured those products for the staff. Um, what we also helped teachers understand is if you can't clean an item, sit time that the virus, this coronavirus, thank goodness, is a somewhat uh, fragile virus, not super fragile, but it's in the middle. And so over time, it goes, it, it stops being infectious. Um, definitely after a week, and we know that really within 72 hours, the infectivity of virus that remains on surface, it is significantly lower. Um, and then we said, you know, and there's going to be times that items are going to be shared or passed where they can't be cleaned. A perfect example is papers. How do you wash the papers you're passing into a teacher? And that's where we rely on hand washing. So, um, so we kind of got back to, we, we always get back to those boring things as nurses. Washing your hands is what's important. Next slide, please. And there we talked about the school plan for hand washing, um, where the hand sanitizers are, how to get more, what do you do if there's no soap and paper towels in the restrooms? Next slide, please. And then we had the schools put in their slides about their plan for social distancing. You know, we know that our principle and our requirement is six foot social distancing, but how that looks really depends on so many school variables that we needed the schools to add their plan um, in the in the slide deck there. Next slide. Then we talked about 
what to do when a student isn't feeling well. Um, what we're trying to do is minimize the number of people who are in the health suite at the same time. Um, that way we don't have two sick students infecting each other and we also don't want six students coming to the class to the health suite when we have a student with a chronic health problem there for for scheduled care. So the nurses have plans and strategies to address that. Um, again, it's site specific based on census, based on configuration of the health suite, but we talked them through um, what to do if a student's not feeling well and what we're going to do. Next slide. Um, we talked also about our student pickup procedures because to the extent that we can, we are asking our parents to remain outdoors and we will be bringing students to them. Um, and that is because if the student on the off chance and not off chance, but it, when a student is sick at school and it turns out it's from COVID, the most common transmission of COVID is within a house. And so if we let the parent in, the parent is statistically more likely probably than anybody else in the building to be an infectious person. So we really don't want to bring people in whenever we don't need to. Next slide, please. Um, we know that our teachers, it's definitely happening now, that our parents report the student having a positive test about half the time to the nurse and the other half the time to the teacher. And so what we wanted the teacher to know is how to handle that. Um, the one of the most important things is that we deal with reports of COVID respectfully and privately, because if we don't, people are not going to help tell us and then we can't manage it in a way to make sure that everyone's safe. And so what we explain to the teachers is what are we going to do? We're going to work with the teacher. What we do is investigate the case and then we see if we need to do contact tracing, which is what's described there. And then what we do in terms of when the student can come back. Next slide, please. Um, what we do if a parent says somebody in the house has COVID, again, it's the same process. Um, and what to do when the parent tells you that the child is sick. So we kind of tried to give them scenarios, let them talk that through so they understood, you know, how and how we will respond, what to expect, and what their role in it is. Next slide. Then we kind of got into what do you do if you're a teacher and not feeling well? People who feel sick, as always, this has always been true, but it's true in COVID with the state protocols. If you feel sick, you have to go home. Uh, we do ask our staff to keep us apprised of what symptoms they have. So we're aware of whether um, Debbie Somerville left the school with um, an illness that might might be COVID, so I want to call her and check on her the next day and help her get tested, or whether Debbie Somerville left with a migraine headache. So just because we're trying not to get that gossip of 16 people telling me different things, if I get it directly from the employee, it helps me as a nurse make the professional judgments to provide the right support. Next slide. A reminder to staff that if they're tested for COVID-19, the requirement is to stay home and that they let the principal know um, if they um, had close contact, because what we do for close contacts and positive tests is those are centrally investigated to make sure that um, people's health privacy is protected and that we link people to HR in the appropriate way. Next slide, please. Um, and this talks them through again, if you're a close contact, what you're going to do. Um, and we are trying to help people understand that if you're a close contact, you're not a risk to others. You need to stay home because we don't want you becoming a risk to others if you develop the illness. But um, sometimes people are like, oh no, I'm quarantined, I'm it, but you're really just at risk and we don't want you sharing. Next slide and what they can expect if they do get a positive test, which is what I just described to you, is that a nurse from our office calls them and does the case investigation. And uh, we again talk about that privacy factor. Next slide. Then we got to questions. So that is the training that each school was provided about COVID. I'm happy to answer questions if you have questions. Thank you so much for that. I really, uh, this is uh, Ms. Scott, I appreciate that. Um, and it might be, you know, this might be something for another, our next meeting, but I wanted to know, 
um, what training or any uh, like social emotional training um, that was given to teachers for, um, especially in an area where maybe there was a higher number of uh, COVID tests that came back positive or kids who may be returning who may have lost multiple family members. Right, right. And, it's, and we definitely have had had pockets of that in our county. Um, and I don't feel I don't feel well versed enough to give the comprehensive answer there. So I think that might be something we could add. I don't see Dr. Nieves or Dr. because that was really handled more. I led this, the, the physical side and Dr. Okay. Nieves' team led the social emotional side. I'm aware of it, but I won't do it justice. Oh yeah, okay, no worries. Then we can, that's something we could maybe um, discuss for our next one. Um, did any other members have any questions? No, okay, thank you, Ms. Somerville. It was very thorough. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, and um, the next item on our uh, agenda is a discussion of the hybrid learning, learning cohorts. Um, Ms. Scott, before we move to our next discussion, Ms. Shea is also here to discuss some additional mitigation um, pieces that she did out of curriculum and instruction. Sure. Just to add the, to the conversation. Yeah, under, under COVID or? Yes. Oh, so okay. I just, I'm, I just want to briefly talk, and, and um, Ms. Somerville already described them. She referenced how in her presentation that the nurses did, they set some general expectations about materials. And so I just wanted to quickly share that um, our special area teachers, uh, so visual arts, music, dance, um, physical education, then also prepared um, specific training for teachers in their areas that reflected those mitigation strategies that um, Ms. Somerville described. So they put together a presentation that was first shared with the health and safety teams and the administration, and then shared with the teachers in their content. So the art teachers got training on how to handle shared art materials in the art room, um, what to do with work that was turned in for um, exhibits. The PE teachers talked, um, got specific guidance around sharing of equipment and how they should handle, um, again, all starting with the training that Ms. Somerville just outlined um, for health and safety, but then specific to their content. Um, and so I just wanted to take an opportunity. I'm not gonna, we have, you know, w way more slides than we have time, but I just wanted to add to what Ms. Somerville shared that um, they did get to hear from uh, visual arts, library media, music and dance, physical education, our passport classes. Um, and then um, I was also able to share within the um, professional development we did with classroom teachers about some of the strategies that um, Ms. Somerville described around how to handle um, passing out papers or bulletin boards um, and things of that nature. So just wanted to add an extra layer and, and offer if there were any questions about that, that there was additional training um, that sort of went hand in hand with the training that Ms. Somerville provided through the school nurses to help our content teachers understand that application through their lens. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Appreciate sure. that. Okay. So if there's no other questions or discussion, then yes, we'll go on now to the discussion of hybrid learning cohorts, phase one and two. All right, good evening everyone. I'm going to go through some district-wide data around hybrid learning co cohorts for phases one and phase two of our re-entry plan. And before I get started, as we think about the data this evening, I want you to specify some of the things that you notice and wonder about the aggregate data. Um, and then also, what do you notice and wonder about the student group data? So the data is broken down by race, zone, and specialized services that students receive. And then to think about the policy and budget implications or impact of this data and to share any additional perspectives, just to put it in context. So this particular graph outlines the um, district. So the students that are in phase one and phase two that opted to um, have in-person hybrid instruction and our students that opted to stay in virtual instruction. The next graph is that information by zone. So we have the east zone, the central zone in the middle and our west zone students um, at the far corner. Go back. 
And then this is our phase one and phase two data by race. So we have our in-person hybrid learning students on one graph and our virtual students on the other district wide. And then our East Zone data by race for phase one and phase two with in person hybrid learning and virtual. And the percentages are based on the proportions of students who selected the different modalities of learning and the different entry points by cohort. Dr. Logan, are these slides in board doc? Yes, they should be in board docs. Dr. Hager asked if these slides are different from the slides in board doc. Yes, they should be actually the same uh, data slides for sure. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And excuse me, Dr. Logan Washington. Um, yes. The two slides, I'm trying to make sense of the slides because something jumped out at me. Can you go back one more? to the oh, so, so this yep. slide here is all zones is that it's correct? all zones yes it's thank all you. zones okay. phase thank one you. and phase two yep and now i'm going to get into the breakdowns of each okay. zone by race thank you great, great question all right so here's our east zone data by race for phase one and phase two so we have our in-person hybrid learning on one graph and our virtual students who will receive virtual learning on the other And here's our East Zone Specialized Services for Phase 1 and Phase 2. Our students have received free and reduced meal services. Our students have received special education services. And our students have received English language learning services. And here's our central zone data by race for phase one and phase two. So we have farm special education and RL services as well for central zone. And now our West Zone students for phase one and phase two. And our special services, specialized services, excuse me, for phase one and phase two. And let me know if you'd like me to go back to anything, as I know that's a kind of a, a click through with the visuals. Yeah, those slides are really um, good. So that's the end of the slide presentation. Yep, that's the end of the data slide presentation. I just have the questions for your consideration. So some of the things, um, what are the things that you notice and wonder about the aggregate data? 
Um, what did you know, notice about the disaggregated data by zone, by race, and by specialized services, and just some of the policy and budget implications or in, any additional perspectives? And Dr. Hager, I apologize. Those were the, I didn't think they augmented any different. I didn't do any updates from when I submitted them, so I apologize that the data might appear different. I don't know. Yeah, the ones that are posted only have a single um, graph on each slide, so you can't okay. see the comparisons. It might be. Um, I don't know what, what happened, the but um, that the graphics uploaded. I apologize. No, 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 no that, that's fine. <laughs> um, I, I apologize because I spent time trying to find the, the slides and so oh, I was uh, a little bit distracted, but um, it did seem like there were um, on the slides. I did see clear uh, differences in the families that chose hybrid versus remaining um, virtual by race ethnicity. Yeah. And I. Um, this is, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hager, are you still? No, um, no, I'm good. Oh, okay. Um, and I noticed um, there was definitely um, a difference in the data based on race, um, but also I saw in the West Zone, it looked like 60% of the students um, were requesting to do virtual learning, which I think that was the highest number. Um, and I noticed also, I believe that the West Zone, um, when I last looked at the um, Baltimore County um, COVID-19 database or dashboard, is also mm -hmm. where the higher numbers of um, cases of COVID-19 also happen. So that's not really a surprise there. That was really fascinating to see that. And um, I think, uh, I, oh, well, yeah, my question was also, what was the time frame of which, did this come out of the survey or how was this collected? So um, the data was collected as of 3-5 um, and we wanted to make sure we presented you all with data that was live and real. So as the as we enter different phases, I will present. So next month I'll present um, the, the remaining phases because by the time we um, meet again, all of the phase we would be in the last phase of the work. So I wanted to give you real time numbers. Um, to make sure that you're reacting to them. So that was really just phase one and phase two. Those are the children that are were in school as of three five. Okay, thank you for that. And um, that data updates every week based on parent election. Hmm, okay, um, this would probably be something good to share with the full board. I'm thinking, um, Miss Mack, you have a comment? Yes, I think what struck me. I mean, there were a lot of things, but it looked like in every zone the Hispanic population, um, the percentages were equal. And I can't even remember what the slides were that had two two circles on each side. Um, can you go back to one of those sure. slides, please? Absolutely. OK, right there. Stop there. OK, okay. so um, as you even on this one in the West Zone, even though there's a, a, a pretty big difference in African-American students on this slide, and I believe the central slide, the um, Hispanic Latinx population is almost identical and it just jumps out at me. I, I, you know, I'm not asking you why, it's just something that jumped yeah. out at me. Sure. Yeah. I guess let's take a look. Uh, we can go back to. There's a 5% difference on one the right here, but then mm -hmm. the next one is identical, I, th uh, I think. So in the central zone, there's a 5% difference, but if you go back, to the east zone, I'm pretty sure it's identical. Well, one one percentage point off, which yeah. is, is pretty fascinating to me. But this is very helpful. Thank you very much. Sure. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And it looks like there is a certain population of students. Looks like it's black slash African American students on almost all of these slides and almost all of the areas that are opting for in larger numbers for virtual learning. I would have to look at it again, but just from what I saw, um, and then the largest amount was in the West Zone, which is 60% that want to stay virtual. But one of the slides also points out that in one area alone, um, there was a big difference in special education students, a much bigger difference than we saw in every any other area. And I apologize, I don't have the slides in front of me, but that I put, took a note that um, I, on the specialized slide, there was a big difference in one area for special ed. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry to keep asking you to go back. Nope, I sure can. So we have 47%. Um, that, That's yeah, West, the West yeah, West most zone. of them looked equal. Um, go, go back again, right here. So central zone. In the central zone, 60% of um, special education students opted for in-person hybrid, and I believe it's in the 40% for the other three area, two areas that you looked at. There's East oh, there's 46. 54, sorry, okay. 54 in East, and then I'll go to West. So we have 60 and 40 in Central. And then 53 and 47 in West. It just looks a little bit more balanced in the other areas. Yeah, in the West Zone, it looks like it is a larger push for remaining. Uh, the numbers look larger for um, virtual learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's just fascinating. I'm, I'll look forward to reading it more in um, in board docs. Sure. Is that what? Okay. If, and if, if they don't come through, just let us know, and we can because it's definitely the same presentation. <laughs> so it might be the ways that the graphics upload. Okay. Yeah, just let us know. Okay, yep, that'd be great. Um, Dr. Hager, you had a question? Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Corns. Uh, he sent the um, the attachment in the chat, so and that, that has the updated slides. So thank you for sending that. Um, so I have you in your office started to think about why you're seeing these disparities in in um, in the choice of return to school among families by uh, specifically African American race. So when we think about um, choice, because choice, parental choice is a perspective that we always have to consider in the, the forefront. Families get to, you know, have the right to choose which um, learning environments are best for their students. But when we think about um, the ways that um, terms and experiences like medical apartheid happen and um, the difference that race makes and has been making during the pandemic, um, one would, would believe or maybe even consider being curious about how that would play out when people are thinking about the return to school. So that's something that I have, you know, have been in discussion with with principals as well as um, our, our zone leadership around considering that, around the ways that parents could possibly be making decisions around the health and safety of their fam families. But again, really affirming this idea that families actually get to make a choice around, you know, the ways that they want their students to receive instruction. But we have talked about the ways that um, disparities that happen in healthcare, um, access to healthcare, the construct of medical apartheid, which is historical in nature, the ways that um, marginalized communities have received healthcare and the ways that the healthcare industry is perceived by these communities. These are, again, just curiosities and things that we have been discussing as we seek to support schools, but we can't take that off the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've, I've been also doing some work on my, my day job on um, vaccine <laughs> hesitancy and kind of thinking about a lot of these same issues from a health um, from a healthcare access perspective, and you know, the, the definition of vaccine hesitancy is really the, that kind of hesitancy and concern, but it's coupled with in the presence of access. And so, I'm just wondering if Absolutely. if we feel that we have done a good job of reaching out to the families to kind of explain what the hybrid learning environment would look like. Because I agree, there's there are probably a lot of kind of historic reasons for for the hesitancy to return to in-person learning. But I'm just wondering if if there was have there been any kind of tailored efforts to reach out to the families that that said no, knowing that they have a choice, but just ensuring that they're it was an informed choice. I guess. Yeah, I definitely think our principals have been in direct communication and really even holding um, community-based information meetings. Um, I know plenty of uh, principals that have been doing that on a school by school basis just to inform and really even show. I know Kiria Joseph had a video to show parents and the families and communities the ways that the school environment looks and other principals have been really, really working hard to get the message out that, you know, we're doing everything as a school system to keep their children safe, but really honoring the fact that um, it's a choice for parents and for communities and to ensure that regardless of that choice that we um, at, in Baltimore County Public Schools are going to offer their students an education that is appropriate regardless of the choice. I would just yeah, also I like could. to oh. add 
that um, we also ran a series of, I think it was about six um, um, uh, ESOL uh, programs uh, that were in native languages. So we ran multiples that were in Spanish and we had one that had um, languages other than Spanish to help our ESOL uh, families understand what was going on. And we also were invited to a local um, Spanish speaking show where we were able to describe um, and use interpreters to describe what we're doing, how we're trying to make it safe, what options are for our family. So um, I just wanted to layer that one as one more um, effort that we made to reach out to help everyone understand and have confidence in our efforts to ensure a safe environment. Absolutely. And we meet with targeted communications um, yeah. weekly to, to ensure that our families have as much information on mitigation, as much, much information on reentry um, through the phases as we can. And if I could just say, I'm sorry, as I actually live on the west side, I'm a parent on the west side, um, and I speak to a lot of parents out on this side of um, the county. And um, when you asked, you know, um, Dr. Hager, if they're making, if it's an informed choice, the choice that I've been hearing or, or, or the hesitation that I've been hearing is, um, uh, again, there's some historic um, background to it, but also the health disparities between um, African-American community, the impact that COVID has had is you just have to turn on the news and see. So, you know, it's vastly, vastly different. And um, in this area, there are larger numbers of cases of COVID. There are people who have multiple family members who have COVID, um, who um, have passed away from COVID, um, maybe people who uh, don't have the same kind of access or don't feel that they will get the same kind of medical treatment um, based on um, history. And, and that's where the informed decision is coming from. So even, you know, with all the outreach and explaining and everything like that, if you've experienced several people who've died, you don't know how you're going to get the vaccine and, you know, having a child maybe go back to the back to school that could then bring that home to the family. You know, it's just a lot of different variables. So there is a lot of fear out there. So um, I just wanted to make sure that 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 was said and, and understood because I completely understand why those numbers look the way that they do. Um, Ms. Pastor, you have a question? Um, yeah, I have a comment. Um, I too uh, speak to a lot of folks as late as today talking to a couple of parents. And also we have to remember that unless you work in a job, and I'm speaking now about vaccines, that unless you work in a job where your company or whatever um, gives you access to being vaccinated, uh, when you're looking at folks who are sending children to school, then they tend to be under the age of those who are presently or up to this point um, qualified to get um, by age a vaccine. So a number of parents that are just are willing to send their children back to school, um, not knowing what they can bring home. And in some of the families, they do have elders who have been vaccinated, but they haven't, the parents haven't been vaccinated. So we'll probably see a change because a number of people said once it's open and accessible widespread, then they will rethink that. Sorry, I apologize. I was muted. Um, OK, do we have any other questions or any additional discussion? OK, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, that was very informative. And um, Mr. Corns, again, thank you for putting that PDF in there so we can. Um, I'd like to take more time, yeah, to, to read it. But um, uh, this is good and, and it looks like it's going to be an ongoing conversation. And at some point, um, you know, I think this would be something great that we could also maybe bring um, to the full board. I think it, it, it would be a great discussion. So sure. um, thanks. So next is and lastly is the creation of a BOE Equity Committee Advisory Council. All right. Yep. So 
At the conclusion of our last meeting, we discussed um, the what, the where, the why, and um, we took some time to take a look at that and um, are kind of going to flesh that out, I guess, together. So when we thought about the what, um, the BOE Equity Advisory Council serves as an advisory council to the Board of Education Equity Committee. That's part of the what. The purpose of the BOE Equity Committee Advisory Council is to provide engagement opportunities for both internal and external stakeholders to discuss systemic equity challenges which are impacted by policy and budget decisions. So the what and then the where and the when. So the council um, will meet with the BOE Equity Committee on a semester basis or twice per year. It is recommended that the BOE Equity Council meet at an agreed upon BCPS school site and or virtually. Now to the WHO. The Equity Committee Advisory Council will be comprised of members from each of the following stakeholder groups aligned with Policy 0100. We thought it was really important to ensure that um, all of our internal and external stakeholders um, had a direct stake, which we all do, in um, the implementation and actualization of Policy 0100 equity. So our internal stakeholders, we believe that would be six principles. One, elementary and one secondary from each zone. And I put a small note to the side um, that two should or could be middle schools based on our district foci on middle school. And then six teachers, one elementary and one secondary from each zone. Four students, one from each zone, middle or high school, and the student member of the board. A representative from the Office of Title I, a representative from Human Resources, and an, a representative from the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. And then our external stakeholders. So one participant from each of the Baltimore County Area Education Advisory Councils, one representative from the NAACP, one representative from the GTGAC, one representative from the BCPS Health Council, one representative from the ESOL Advisory Council, one representative from the CCAC, so that's our Special Education Advisory Council, the BCPS PTA Council President, one parent represent, representative, excuse me, from each zone, one LGBTQIA plus committee member, and a representative from the Baltimore County Diversity, Inclusion and Equity Community Advisory Council. May I um, just interject for a moment? Yeah. We just, uh, I just want to make clear um, that we're offering this, this as suggestions or proposals. I just want to make sure that like, you know, we didn't make these decisions. Like we're putting out their ideas and um, offerings for your consideration. So I just wanted to, when I looked at how the, the slide read, I realized <laughs> I wanted to just make sure people knew that we we're proposing ideas for you to consider. Thank yep, you. Definitely a draft. And then the how. So our some of our how questions are what topics or or would, would the direction of the discussion be? What would the structure be? Would it be whole group or subgroup? Because when we um, did the math, it was about 46, almost 50 people. If we used our stakeholder groups in that way, again, just a draft and a suggestion for your consideration. And then what would the intended impact on policy and budget be by the council? So I'll go back to the. Yes, so we're we're at this point. We really sort of put these forward as draft working um, considerations for you as a committee, and um, we stand ready to take your feedback and your modifications and um, revisions that you'd like us to to build into this. Thank you. I think it's a it's a it's a good start. Definitely, it definitely um, gives us. Um, food for thought and something to think about. And I just um, would like to hear, um, yeah, we have a question from Dr. Haber, wonderful. Um, but I think I just wanted to say also that uh, it's it's definitely a place where we can start from and then maybe even pick up at our next meeting. Um, you know, because I want to get make sure everybody has time to think about it, look at it, review it, and then, sure. um, you know, come back Ab with suggestions. Yeah, absolutely. We just wanted to sort of start 
forming this in some yeah. some workable beginning for everyone. So thank you. Yeah, Dr. Hager. Um, thank you for pulling this together. Um, it's it's exciting to see it kind of start to unfold and um, and kind of start to have a vision. Um, so I I think I told you before I I think of this in the same way that we think of school health councils in the state. So I told you every school system has a school health council and then ideally every school would have a wellness team and then there's also a state school health council. Um, and so I, I think that structure lends itself well to, to, to this topic area in a similar way. Um, one thing that we say about school health councils is that they can operate in, in several different ways. One is to help write the wellness policy so we already have an equity policy that we just revised and approved um, but they could help inform kind of the policy at the system level but they can also help to um, inform practices at the school level and i think um, from what we've learned that that's really the more effective approach is to kind of take the the um and it sounds like from the the folks you were proposing to sit on the committee that that is maybe where we were thinking as well kind of the the um, looking downwards instead of looking up to the school system. Um, and so having said that, I'm a little worried about the 46 people because that's a lot of yeah, people for a committee. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and um, and also only meeting twice a year um, is also another thing that I, I just worry that it would be really difficult to make any progress on kind of the work that's done. Um, and I am happy to talk at length about different models of how health councils work if we want to use any of that kind of um, on the ground experience about, you know, visiting schools and different um, scorecards that have been developed and things like that, that that health councils can use to support their their school or equity councils can use then to support the schools within the district. And um, I really think this could be something so wonderful that um, is impactful, but also a potential model for other systems. And so I'm just genuinely really excited about this idea. Um, and again, I'm happy to, to dig deep and talk more about some of the experiences I've had on the on the other side with the health stuff. So. If I may, Dr. Hager, what frequency would you recommend? We we were just putting out uh, twice a year thinking like a first semester and a second semester. I didn't know about the summer, so I'd be interested in hearing what you think might may be a frequency for consideration. So it seems like most meet um, at minimum four times a year. Um, but some do meet monthly knowing that they, you know, sometimes don't meet in December and not in the summer and, you know, things like that. Um, and then there are a number of health councils around the state that do have like committees within the council mm -hmm. um, that then meet on other times. So um, depending on kind of how this ends up rolling out, um, there are health councils that break into small groups and go to visit schools and things like that and then and then come back together and then have um, have discussions and and again, I, I think that there are lots of really great ideas. Um, one of the more effective health councils in one of our counties, um, instead of having six principals, has one principal per grade level. So one elementary, one middle and one high. And then they report back to their kind of principal cohort meetings. And so they become like the liaison. Mm -hmm. um, and so just that may be one idea of a way to um, I was going to ask you, Dr. Hager, if you had any examples that we could rely on your expertise. Oh, uh, so many. You know, 24 of them. <laughs> so, yeah, um, Thank you. That you think we should look at or, it, or yeah, yeah. Now you don't feel, I don't want to put you on the spot right now. I just couldn't. Oh, no, that. it's that something I don't talking about. So um, <laughs> it's totally fine. Yes. Yeah, the, the membership um, piece, I do think it should be purposeful. So I really like how you've got you, you've kind of listed out the different groups that that could be um, members. And do we have an ESOL advisory council? I was under the impression that we did not have an active ESOL advisory council. Yeah, we are actually in the process of standing up an, uh, an ESOL. Um, oh, I can't think of the, the term, but essentially a council to advise us um, it, it's not a board council, but um, we're do, Dr. Not, uh, excuse me, I'm getting tired. <laughs> Ms. Hernandez, who is our director of ESOL and World Languages, um, has experience establishing that. She had one in Anne Arundel County when she worked there um, in charge of World Languages there, um, and we were on track to start formulating it, and then a, 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 you know the world turned inside up upside down inside out and um, and we actually just met uh, about two three weeks ago to try to get that movement back because you know we're coming towards the end of this year and 
we're all excited to get back to normalcy next year. So. No, I think that I think it's wonderful and, and definitely needed. So that that would be really great. Um, yeah, but and we can I don't know if it's better to talk offline or at a public meeting, but I, again, I, I can tell you lots of different different ways that it's done um, from a Thank health council perspective. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I would like to read over it more. I like the idea of meeting maybe four times at, and, and the only reason is because I think there's so many different things, but I do. I don't I don't want it to be too large though mm -hmm. where. Uh, so but I do like everything that you gave us because it's I, I feel good about starting large and then working our way down um, and then coming to um, to get to a good result for that and then meeting at a school um, or maybe it's meeting at I think you all said maybe at different schools yeah. um, around the the, the, um, the county um, so that we're getting um, um, I guess um, so that we're kind of sharing it and, and everything like that. Um, would this be something like where parents would come in and listen or um, would it be uh, maybe live streamed or would they be invited to listen or would it just be where like were we envisioning? I don't know how the health councils work, but like where we would just meet and then an update would maybe be given at the board or at our equity committee meeting. I don't know, maybe that's something we could think about. I'm trying to think if there's any anything else. Um, oh, did anyone else have any questions? I don't want to monopolize. <laughs> I have a comment to make um, and my home phone's ringing, so hold on one second. Um, I attend, as I'm sure many of you do, the area advisory committees for um, this area. Yeah. And um, obviously pre pre COVID they attempted to have these meetings at different schools and literally there would be nights where nobody showed up. So I, you know, I, I would hope with a council this big that that would not happen, but it was clearly a case of um, some schools were well attended and others were not. So it, one of the things I think we'd have to look at as a team is how to get the word out and how to encourage participation. That's a good point. Okay, because um, I know we could probably also even meet at the um, at the board once we everything goes back to normal. Um, but I'm wondering if if we would consider. Um, I've had people tell me as I've joined different meetings, um, like a PTA meeting, that more people join now remotely than have ever joined in the past. And I'm wondering if that would hold true for this or if we would lose something by attempting to have virtual meetings, um, even though we might gain representation. Hmm. That is definitely something to take into consideration. Yeah, because the idea is we do want um, the most participation. Um, how do you all feel about putting out like maybe um, a survey to our parents or I don't want to over survey. Um, I guess maybe to get some feedback or um, or maybe there's already something out there that would give us a feedback as far as what. Um, but that's an idea too virtual to in person um, like Dr. Hager said. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something to think about what has worked in the past. So this is a good start though. Thank you. I, I have to really uh, for the entire presentation this evening really, you know, kudos goes to uh, Dr. Logan Washington. She's she's really done a great job and she continues to just um, support all of us in this uh, committee and our work moving forward. So thank you, Ms. Scott. And, um, hey, oh, it looks like there is another comment from Dr. Hager. Please go ahead. Um, I was just thinking instead of a kind of a survey that maybe we could take uh, reach out to some of these stakeholders that um, that have been traditionally very engaged mm -hmm. to kind of see where where they would see a, a, a committee like this going and kind of so almost establishing some early goals that may kind of then draw people in if they know why we're meeting and it's not you know just kind of exploring ideas but instead you know this group will come together to do X Y and Z this year you know so that we have um, Again, some early early ideas and goals, um, almost like a, you know, little think tank of, of uh, colleagues that we could, could I love bring it. together. 
I, I think, you know, part of um, to me that what could help with all of those trying to find the best answers for all those questions is coming kind of back to that purpose of this council, right? This purpose of this council is to advise this committee on actions you can take. And uh, as board members, your actions really anchor in budget and policy, you know, and I think, you know, I, I think it'll be, I would love to hear Dr. Hager more about like your experience with the health council, like who, where does that work go? Like I know some experiences I've had, but I think yours are more comprehensive and you have a larger view, you know, do those, uh, those your experience with councils, they provide recommendations then to the board to take action around budget, around policy or, you know, um, operational actions for schools to do. I just I think that's something for us to think about. And as that becomes more specific, I think some of these other things will um, the path will kind of lay itself out, if you will. Is that a um, uh, yes? Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Is that a maybe a presentation or something that we could have at our next equity committee um, committee meeting? Um, more information on the councils, how they work, like some of the things that you just brought up, Dr. McComas, and then that way we could hear more about that so that we could have, um, it could help inform our decision on, on um, you know, if we wanted to use that model, which of those is the best model for us to use. Right. Yeah, would, um, Ms. Scott, would you, would you like me to present or me to share the information with Dr. McComas? What, what are you thinking? Whichever, yeah, if you could present or, you and Dr. McComas together present, you know, whichever <laughs> works well for you, for you guys. But yeah. yeah, Dr. Hager, if you, um, you know, and again, I don't mean to put you on on the spot. But I, yeah. I, I think I said last time I already have I already have the PowerPoint presentation made. Oh, so okay. 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 Yeah. There we go. OK, perfect. Yes, I love okay. it. That would be okay. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Beth. Yeah. OK, so yeah, so now. Um, I think we've yeah. had a really Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say we're right at that spot, Ms. Yeah. Uh, Scott, that like let's set our next steps for our next agenda. And yep, we're um, up I think. Going. Go ahead. Nope, that's why I was getting ready to yeah. pass it over to you. <laughs> oh, OK, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Our next agenda. I'm sorry, I'm a little off my game today. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, I'm trying to get, get up to speed. Um, <laughs> So what you see on the top there, um, we have listed the different topics that have come up over time, right? And so I wanted to make sure that we continue to bring them, you know, as we present on things and we feel like, okay, we're done and we'll move on, we'll take it off the list. But that way you can continue to see topics that you have brought up over time. And then um, I know we want to set our agenda for the next meeting. So I think I, I definitely heard one of the agenda items for next meeting is um, Dr. Hager will share with her, share with us um, some models of advisor or councils that she's worked on from the health council. Um, so we have that. And then I don't know um, what else you would like for the next um, meeting. Um, I had requested um, also, Dr. You had said, um, uh, uh, Mr. Nivias. Oh yes, uh, Dr. Nieves. Yes, thank Nieves, you. Excuse um, me. Yeah, yeah. To give us a, the, the SPL. Mm -hmm. yeah emotional update um, yep. as far as emotional supports for our children returning. Yes, I'll make sure I get with Dr. Nieves for that. And then. Yep. We'll also have um, the remaining phase data, so we'll be looking at more um, reentry data by zone, by race, and by specialized programs also. Great, that'd be good. If I think probably almost at every meeting having mm -hmm. that updated um, data, maybe that could be a standing agenda item because it, it yep. sounds like it's going to yep. change. Okay. okay, perfect. Okay, and that is, I mean, not that we have to limit it to those three items, but um, for 90 minutes, those three items might be really the full agenda. Um, I agree. Because, you know, we'd like to be able to have the discussion. Um, so we'll just continue to have these topics and we'll just build out the presentations or the agendas each time. That works. Perfect. And we'll make sure we add the um, update, the cohort update data for each of the months. Uh, just keeping in mind that we have moving forward April, May and June. So we have uh, three meetings um, and I think we had discussed typically the committees don't meet in July. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that's will be our practice in alignment with the other committees, but uh, certainly if we want to meet in July, I'll be there. Right. Um, 
Yeah, I didn't have any changes in practice, okay. so I assume as well. OK, great. So just one last follow up item. Um, I am working to provide Ms. Peshore with the information about the equity team survey. So I should have a report on that um, for our April meeting as well. So what schools have an equity team and some additional information um, per her request from our last meeting. So I just wanted to give her an update and to give Ms. Mack an update on her equity dashboard long range project. That data has been submitted to our data research accountability and assessment. Um, department and they are working on that data and again the delay based on the ransomware attack so we gotta look for some things but those things have been requested thank you thank you dr logan washington that was actually my question um will they can we get the data that they have and incorporate that in upcoming meetings i mean i i guess i understand the ransomware attack happened but I, I think I requested this at the first meeting, and if we're not having a meeting in July, it could be a whole year before we even have data on which we can make educated decisions. Absolutely. I will um, follow up with that particular division this week, um, and whatever they can provide me, I absolutely will um, provide you next month. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Ms. Scott. Yes, Ms. Pastor? Pastor. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. you. Um, um, Dr. Logan Washington, thank you for um, getting on that information because I think that information is going to support uh, that conversation about the uh, committee um, and it will also support our work as we go forward. Um, so I had a question it just jumped right out of my brain, uh, but it has to do with what we do with that information. I think as a committee, uh, Ms. Scott and members, and especially if we have that committee, that um, we'll be able to move forward with using that information to make sure that the equity is consistent straight across the board in all of our schools. And that really wasn't the question. So I'm just going to shut up now because it just jumped right out of my brain. Thank you. <laughs> you can always feel free to email your question, Ms. Pastor. Thank you for that. Yes, that is the goal. Once we get everything and, and bring it together, the idea is then to take action and, and make sure that we're that it's equitable across um, across the system. So OK, is there any further? Is there any further business? OK, well, thank you everyone for your time and um, for our wonderful presentations and all the hard work of this committee. And I appreciate everything that each of you do. So um, yeah, so since there is no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.